Now this time I'll be continuing in the book of Mark, chapter 6. And I'll be starting in verse 45. But just to give a reminder of the context of what we talked about last week, is last week was the feeding of the 5,000. Now the feeding of the 5,000 showed us a great lesson about God's providence, God's providence, and God's ability to sustain us in every way that we need. But moving from there, it says here in, in verse 45, right after they counted the 5,000, it says, And straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida, while he sent away the people. Now, Bethsaida, just for context, there is only one disciple is from Bethsaida, which is Philip. Now, Philip, we actually know, he was the one who went and looked at the prices of the loaves during the feeding of the 5,000. This is just somewhat interesting because we don't know that much about Philip. But one of the most famous miracles of Jesus, Philip had a huge part in it. And we know that he had a huge part in it simply because they were right outside of Bethsaida. And it says in the other Gospels that he was the one who acquired it all. But they wanted to go before unto Bethsaida, while he sent away the people. Now, he does this a lot, actually. A lot of times Jesus will send his disciples either ahead of him or simply away from him on their own purpose, on their own goal. For example, when he wasn't reaching them in Nazareth, he sent his disciples to preach there instead while he went round about the cities in Galilee. Matter of fact, our Sunday school this morning talked about his rejection at Nazareth. But here he's sending them essentially to go before him, to go ahead of him. He sends them unto Bethsaida while he sent away the people. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. Now, he would often pray, and this actually confuses a lot of people nowadays about why Jesus would pray. Most specifically, a lot of Muslims and or new Christians get confused why Jesus would pray. Well, Jesus prayed to have that intimate communion with the Father in that he had a human nature. He wasn't solely God, he was also human. And his human nature longed for that unity with God that we as humans all have. We all have that longing for that communion with God And for that reason, he departed into a mountain to pray. This is also to set an example and to have that stronger relationship with the Father during his incarnation. But he sent them away, and he departed into the mountain to pray. So you would expect, they're taking the ship, the ship's faster than going around on the land. They're going to get there long before Jesus. But it says, when the evening was come... The ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them, as in it was a very stormy weather. And about the fourth watch of the night he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. So, they're essentially rowing against the wind. Now, normally you wouldn't do this, but Jesus sent them on a mission. They're going to go exactly where Jesus sent them. And so they were rowing, rowing against the wind, which that's, that's an upward, an uphill battle the entire time. And then it says he just goes out walking on the sea. And it seems that he has such little resistance, he walks upon it with such ease that he would have passed by them. He's going faster than them in their boats. But, this is why it says that 
he would have passed by them. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit and cried out. For they all saw him and were troubled. And let me just, with spirit, it's actually the Greek word is phantasma, which is most typically used with ghosts. So, this isn't them viewing him as like the Holy Spirit. This is them viewing him similar to us viewing ghosts. That if we saw a ghost in the middle of the night, we would be terrified. And that's a reasonable response. They says they were troubled. And when them seeing him walk upon the sea, no human does that. It makes sense for them to believe he's a spirit or a ghost. Because no normal human can do that. But it says, They cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled. And immediately he talked with them and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. So he can tell that they're scared. Now, it doesn't say it very well here. And I don't want to say that it's a translation because it's hard to tell unless you look at the Greek. But he says something incredibly important in this verse that he doesn't say anywhere else until basically his trial in the book of Mark. When we talk about Jesus as God, most of the time we go to the book of John because John focused on Christ's divinity. And John put a huge emphasis on recording when Jesus said, I am. And in Greek, the word is ego, I am, or I am I. Now, in here, we don't see it, but those words are right in verse 50, where he says, It is I. The word is actually, I my ego. He uses the holy name when addressing them. It says, For they all saw him and were troubled, and immediately he talketh with them and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Another translation renders it as, Be of good cheer, I am, be not afraid. Now, of course, it went over their head because at this time, even up until his crucifixion, they still didn't truly realize who he was. As a matter of fact, the first apostle to realize who he was was the one that we call Doubting Thomas. But here, he's trying to reaffirm them and, in a way, explain how he is doing what he is doing. Now when he says, be of good cheer, does I be not afraid, he's not only telling them, one, it's him. He's not just some random ghost. And the second thing is, be not afraid, and most importantly, it is I. He's letting them know, I'm not a ghost. Because there were many times when Jesus was almost killed. As a matter of fact, in Luke chapter 4, it records that in his own hometown, he was almost killed. So when he sent them on their way and was left alone, as far as they were concerned, either this was a random ghost, or this was, unfortunately, their dear master. But to them, there was no way for a living man to walk out on the water. But he says, and he went up unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased. This wind that was so stormy that he was able to walk past the boat with all twelve disciples rowing. And it says, when the wind ceased, and they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure, and wondered. For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. Now, 
this one is a somewhat of a complex verse. It is they considered not the miracle of the loaves. This talks about a couple of things, and honestly, this one verse you could probably do a sermon on by itself. But what it is, is they didn't recognize who he was. It says that they were amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered or marveled. For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. Now this, this shows that they saw the miracles. They saw the miracle of the loaves. This being the twelve disciples, the twelve apostles. And yet it says they did not consider. They did not consider the miracle of the loaves. Now, why would they not consider the miracle of the loaves? It says their heart was hardened. Now, that's actually a very strong statement to make. And a lot of people get it wrong. Some people view the hardening of the heart as something that, in a way, damns people to hell. I've seen many people speak of the hardening of the heart as God's way of sending someone to hell on earth. Because Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and Pharaoh's heart made him completely reject God's ways. So how come it says that their heart was hardened? Well, because the hardening of the heart isn't exactly temporal, isn't exactly permanent. The hardening of the heart is always something that can change. It says at this point their heart was hardened, which in a way, when it says hardened, it means more solid, more solidified, stuck in their ways. And it needed to be softened for them to be open to these new ideas. Now, what was the ideas in their head at the time? Jesus was their teacher. Jesus was their rabbi. Jesus was their good master. Jesus was a great man. Maybe even Jesus was a prophet. But they didn't really consider that Jesus was more. They didn't even consider that He was the Messiah. Which is shocking because before Jesus even went into the wilderness, John the Baptist declared that Jesus was the Messiah. But as we know, John the Baptist was unfortunately executed before they realized who he was. But another thing about them not considering the miracle of the loaves is the miracle of the loaves and this are put side by side for a reason by Mark. Now we learn from Luke the order of events, very specific order of events. But with this, we again see parallels to the Exodus. Jesus did a lot to demonstrate his similarities to God, especially to the most important event in Israel's history. The Exodus where God set their entire people free. The event that would be most dear to their heart, especially in the captivity of Rome. And what did God cause the Israelites to do for the Exodus? The, probably the most well-known miracle of them all. They crossed the Red Sea. Now, that is just somewhat of a loose connection. The main reason that it says that they didn't consider the miracle of the loaves was simply to teach us there was a lot that Jesus wanted them to know from that that would have helped them in this circumstance that they didn't get. They didn't get that Jesus was able to feed 5,000 people because He's God. They didn't get that Jesus 
did this to demonstrate that He will still provide and set free God's people the way He did before. As a matter of fact, Jesus is the same God that set them free in the Exodus. And if we remember, the very first thing that led to the Exodus was Jesus, well, God, speaking to Moses. And when asked to tell them in Exodus 3.14 who sent him, he says, tell them, I am sent you. And here he says, be of good cheer, and in the Greek, I am. Be not afraid. That is what it's saying they didn't consider because their hearts were hardened. What they sought out was not what he was. And what they expected from him was not what he was. And thus, every time he showed who he truly was, it confused them. It amazed them. And it says, When they had passed over, they came into the land of Gennesaret and drew to the shore. And when they were come out of the ship straightway, they knew him, and ran through and whole, the whole region round about, and began to carry about in beds those that were sick, where they heard he was. And whithersoever he entered into villages or cities or country, they laid the sick in the streets, and besought him that they might touch, if it were, but the border of his garment. As many as touched him were made whole. Now, touching the border of his garment, we talked a little bit about before with the woman who was healed just through touching the border of, her, of his garment, through that faith, that belief that even this, the smallest piece connected to him had the power to heal because they had that much faith in him. But what I find amazing is when I look at that and I compare it to the disciples, that reaction is better than the disciples gave. And why is that reaction better than what the disciples gave? Because their hearts were hardened. Now, why would I focus on the disciples' hearts being hardened? Obviously, the disciples had an amazing contribution to God's ministry. Is it maybe not fair to focus on their hearts having been hardened before? But to me, I would say it's the exact opposite. The fact that their hearts were hardened, and yet they still became some of the greatest contributions to the ministry, shows me that no one in the whole world is beyond help. A lot of times we think about Pharaoh's heart being hardened, as a demonstration of him just diving into darkness. And I would say that while his heart was hardened, it was a dark spirit in him. That he was away from the light. But when we see the disciples, we understand that that wasn't exactly against his will. You see, when your heart is hardened, that's not God saying, faith is unavailable to you. It's God saying that for this time and for this purpose, you don't yet have faith. Now, it doesn't exactly say whether it was God who hardened their hearts or whether their hearts were already hardened. But what it does show us is that a hardened heart can still result in a faithful one a hardened heart can still result in a saved one. And now, I, I try not to go to outside texts. I, I try to avoid it through the sermon series because I like to keep within. But especially when it comes to the hardening of the heart, I, I want to bring to mind a very important verse from Ezekiel. Now, Ezekiel taught many things. He had one of the, in my opinion, one of the most important revelations 
in the whole of Scripture. He talked about the, hit, the future of our lives, the future of our individual souls. Many of the prophets spoke specifically of nations and of kingdoms, but Ezekiel was given this revelation about our souls. And it says here, in, in chapter 36, verse 24, For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness and from your idols will I cleanse you. And a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and will give you a heart of flesh. And so that hardened heart is taken out of us. That hardened heart is taken away. And it says, And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. So, God takes our hardened hearts away. Now, not everyone is open to God. And this is my firm belief, is that many times we harden our hearts. We harden our hearts in the same ways that we sear our conscience. But that never means that we're beyond saving. I don't believe there's a soul out there that can't be saved with the gospel. Some choose to reject it and some keep away from it. But we see at least 12 people here, well, 11, that their hardened hearts didn't stay hardened. And as a matter of fact, of them, Ten of them all died gruesome, painful deaths, suffering for the man that at one point they had a hardened heart towards. Now, I, I don't want to say that they weren't faithful to God. Nothing in here seems to imply that they didn't sincerely want to follow Him. They have some of the greatest testimonies dropping their nets and running after Jesus. But simply obeying God isn't the same as having faith in Him. See, there's a lot of people who can do the works that need to be done. But if their heart isn't open to the truth that God has, they will see things from God and view that with the lens that they want to see. And for anyone in Judea, the lens they wanted to see was the Messiah is going to come through and set us free from this Roman reign. The Romans were horrible people. And I speak that of their cruelty. There's records of the Romans having used human beings as wall decorations and as lamps. They were a horridly cruel people. They were far worse than even the Babylonians. And so to every Judean, the biggest thing they wanted in their life was to be set free from these Romans. And so what did they expect? An earthly mighty ruler who would justly bring their vengeance upon Rome and their wickedness. And what they got was to them disappointing. Because they had these expectations, what they got was essentially a shepherd for men was to put it bluntly a huge disappointment to them. They didn't want anything to do with this shepherd because what's a shepherd going to do to set them free? But they didn't understand that what this shepherd this good shepherd does is far more important. See, the Romans, they persecuted each and every one of these apostles. 
Yet towards the end of their lives, they realized that there was a reward greater than earthly joys. When they started this ministry, it says that when people wanted Jesus to become king, that they went out and said, Jesus, come on into town. They're going to make you king and they're going to, they're going to use you to become king by force and they're going to start a revolutionary army. And towards the end of their life, they abandoned those desires instead realized that God's kingdom isn't an earthly one. It's not one that you can expand through sword. It's not one that you can defend with a shield. See, if, as I stand here today, if something were to happen in this world and we all were to pass away, none of that could defeat God's kingdom. But if we build up our lives in some king on the earth or through some army, that's something that can pass away. And that seems to be the way that their heart was hardened. It wasn't hardened in that they were working against God. They were willing to follow His commands. But their heart was hardened in that they couldn't change their ways of thinking. They thought the same ways after they met Jesus as they did before they met Jesus. They still thought of Him as the King that can set them free. And in a way, they were right. Jesus was the King who could set them free. But He came to set them free from the bondage of sin, not the bondage of Rome. And as we know, Rome fell on its own. And then the next kingdom came up to persecute them, and that kingdom fell. And as every kingdom will rise up to persecute them, they all will fall, yet God's kingdom has yet to fall. See, what they expected was an eternal kingdom, and to them, the disappointment has created the only kingdom that's still around to this day. That's what it means that their hearts was hardened. They didn't consider the miracles. They did not consider the miracle of the loaves. They didn't consider any of it. They saw him as a miracle worker that was there to bring an earthly kingdom, when in reality, and especially with the feeding of the 5,000, his first priority was teaching them. His first priority was bringing them closer to him. And so their, their shock and amazement is not surprising to us. But if you lived then, I like to think that I would have seen something more in him. I can't say that I would have, but I'd like to say that. I know it's hard to put ourselves in the feet of the apostles, but I'd like to just, for just a minute, right before I'm done, because the apostles, I think, are a great example that we can follow. I know when I say that it shows that not everyone is beyond help, that that's something to apply to those that we can evangelize to. And we should keep that in mind. But we should also keep in mind that it's very possible that we are the, in a way, hardened apostles. Now, I don't want to confuse this with unsaved, but I want to show that even the apostles could be obedient to Jesus and not understand Him. And it seems that they were not willing to recognize that they didn't understand Him. Is it possible that we think about Jesus in a way that makes Him more what we want Him to be? Is it possible that when we think of Jesus, we turn Him into our version of Jesus? Or in a way, what we would do if we were Jesus? I hear so many churches preaching a Jesus that just happens to align with exactly what they would love Jesus to say. 
that Jesus is all accepting of everything. Or, on the other hand, that Jesus hates anyone who isn't part of their church. And the fact is, Jesus is Jesus, and we can't make him into whoever we want him to be. We just have to follow him to who he is. Is Jesus a miracle worker? Yes. Is Jesus all forgiving? Yes. Is Jesus just? Yes. Is Jesus a prophet? He delivered a message from God. Yes. Is Jesus one who served those below him? Yes. But most importantly, is Jesus God? And Jesus would respond as he did in verse 50, I am. Jesus is who Jesus is. And we can't change him to who we want him to be. We have to change who we want him to be to who he is. So what I would challenge us all today is to think over our lives. First off, to think about others, to understand that even the most far gone still have hope. And not only do they have hope, they have incredible, astronomical hope. I would love to have lived the life of the Apostle John or the Apostle Peter. And though I could focus on the times that they failed, I think that even the times that I've done well for God, I think back to Pentecost. I think back to the fact that John didn't even hesitate to run into the tomb. These are incredible men of faith, but even they didn't start that way. And even when they chose to willingly follow Jesus, they still had their problems. And we as Christians shouldn't expect no problems from others, and we also shouldn't expect no problems from ourselves. We should be okay to acknowledge that we have our problems. Because it's when we realize that maybe we don't have it right, that we can get it right. And even Peter, directly after he was given a, a wonderful commissioning in his very name, Peter, still didn't get it. In the very next verse in Matthew, it says that he was rebuking Jesus. We can't expect perfection from ourselves, but because we can't expect perfection from ourselves, that gives us the opportunity to grow closer. Because if I know I'm not perfect today, I could focus on that fact and be torn down and worn down from it. Or I could see that as I love being close to God, and that means there's another way I can get closer to Him. And maybe a way after that. And a way after that to just get closer and closer each and every day. But we have to take that step. And we have to believe in Him. We have to trust in Him. And we have to consider Him. We have to thoughtfully look through the Bible, see the things that He's done, and see what that means about Him. And once we understand what that means about Him, we can best understand what that means for us. But the most important thing to know about Him is that He is our Savior. Jesus is our God. But for us, the most important thing to remember is that He is our Savior. Because He will be our God whether or not we believe Him. But we have a choice whether we let Him save us. We have a choice whether we take that offering or whether we cast Him away. Whether we treat Him like He is her Savior or whether we treat Him like He is nothing. And that's what it boils down to, is He is either our Savior to us, our God, the Almighty, or He is nothing. You can't go halfway with Jesus. To call him a prophet or to call him a great man and to leave it as only that 
dishonors Him. Because that's not who He said He was. Jesus served many roles, but when asked who He is, who He believed He was, He said He is the I Am. And if we believe anything less about Him, we believe nothing about Him. By this time, if you don't have that faith, if you don't have that trust in Him as your Savior, or that trust in Him as your God, that's the strongest faith that we can have. And I couldn't go into it today because it's in, I believe it's Matthew's Gospel record of this. But Peter went out on faith. And as he began to sink, he called out to Jesus, Save me! And it just been calling upon Jesus to save him, like that, he saved him. Jesus brought him out of the water. But you have to call on him. If Peter never called on Jesus, Peter would have kept sinking. You have to ask him to save you. You have to invite him into your life. Because if you don't want to be around God, you won't be around God. If you don't want to be saved, you won't be saved. But if you call on Him, He is faithful and just to forgive you of all unrighteousness that we may be saved. But we have to have that faith. But this time, the altar is open. If you'd like to rededicate your life, if you'd like to be baptized, if you'd like prayer for anything, or if you would like to ask Christ into your life, whatever you need, we invite you to come as we sing. The altar is open. Let's all stand.